Hello everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel. I am Jessica Henry Gray and I'm really excited to have you back today. Today I'm going to show you how to paint this landscape from a photo with acrylics. So I'm really excited to share this with you. I'm a little bit new to acrylics so this is going to be exploratory. So um, I hope that you go ahead and like and subscribe this video if you enjoy it and be sure to check out the links below. I do still have room in my workshop um, where we're going to do something very similar to this, this landscape from a photo. It's just sort of mentally prepare you for plein air painting. Um, that is my Zoom workshop and I do have some other workshops coming up. And join our newsletter and you'll be updated on all of my next year's schedule for workshops. All right, you guys, so let's jump in and we will get going on this. Today I want to show you how to work in acrylics. I get asked a lot how to work in acrylics, so I thought why not show you in an easy environment in my studio. So I have a simple landscape I'm going to show you on uh, just a gesso panel and I will take you down here and show you my palette and all of my equipment. All right, so let's jump in. Okay, so I got this palette um, from Masterson. It is a stay wet palette. And I like this size because it's only eight by 10 and it will fit in my plein air painting box. In my little wooden box so it fits right in there and my canvas will be above it but here in the studio it's going to work just fine and I also like this one because it had um, the sponge inside it so you can get the sponge wet and then you have to buy their certain kind of paper and they they do sell a, a few sheets of paper with the palette but I bought I bought a whole pack of paper here to go with it um, just you soak it and you can use it and um, get it wet let it dry a little bit. It's kind of, it's like dry to the touch, but you can feel it's slightly damp. Okay. So, and I'm going to put my acrylic paints on here and I bought um, all of my normal palette colors plus a couple extras for doing some other um, things that I typically like to use, uh, cad red light and um, a little bit of burnt umber here. Okay. So um, I bought Old Holland. Um, I like the brand in oil paints. I don't typically use them, but I do like them. So I got all the same colors I normally use. Um, so I'm going to put them on my palette here and I'll tell you what they are as I squeeze them out. So this is titanium white and I'm going to put it all in the same order that I typically do for my oil paints. Cadmium yellow medium, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, a little tiny bit of phthalo green, a little bit of alizarin crimson, because I feel that my burnt sienna is not as dark as what I'm used to. I'm just going to put some out, a little bit of burnt umber. Now there's one more step I want to do. I also bought from Old Holland, this is called Retarder Gel Medium, and you can mix just a little bit. It says 10%, whatever 10% would be to that. So I'm just going to take a little scoop with my palette knife and mix it into each one of these piles of color and that will slow down the drying time. Now this is something that I like because I like how oils work but I know a lot of people don't want to work in oils for various reasons and perhaps they like how fast acrylics dry. I personally don't so I'm going to put a little um, what seems to me like 10% with each one of these piles and then I'll use this palette knife and mix it in before I begin. Oops, kind of a lot. So 
Okay. So. Um, I, so if I feel like the piles are starting to get a skin, I'm just going to spritz them down with a little bit of water. And I have my paper towels handy and my glass of water over here. Bring this a little bit closer. I'll set this right here. And then you can use your regular oil painting brushes or just use some um, um, these acrylic. They're also for acrylic and oil paints, synthetic fibers. So I like those too. So I'm going to have a few handy. Let's jump in and get going. So I'm going to show you here the image that I'm going to do. I painted this image in oil paints yesterday. So I'm going to do it today in acrylic since it's all fresh in my head. <laughs> and this is the actual building where we were sitting out and painting. Um, and I just, we chose that um, building, the, the off-side building. I see we, I was working with a student. And these are my sketches that I came up with just to really isolate and boil it down to what I wanted to do that was most important. Um, so that I'm beginning the same way I would begin an oil painting. This is an acrylic primed, um, well, gessoed panel. And I put a coat of burnt sienna, a little bit of yellow ochre, and a small bit of ultramarine blue and water on it. And of course it dried right away. Uh, I rubbed that off a little bit and I don't mind some of that texture of the brushwork showing through. So now utilizing my sketch, I am looking at my drawings and also the photo reference and determining exactly where on the canvas this should fit. So if you know, remember in the little sketch that I had that had the dark markings all over it, that was just sort of isolating exactly where in the, the divisions will be where I want um, this image to sit on my canvas. Holding my brush very loosely, I'm just mapping out where this, um, the perspective issues and where this um, little hut, hut, I don't know, somebody said, oh, nice outhouse. <laughs> I don't know if it's an outhouse, but anyway, I was just trying to figure out exactly where it would be with the perspective angles. And then I'm, again, I'm holding it loosely because I can just wipe it off. Even though it's acrylic, I've, I made a few mistakes and I wiped it off and it kind of took out some of the paint underneath the um the brush stroke that i had just put down but that was okay i mean it's just the tone that was removed anyway so it wasn't a really big deal um, but even either way some people like to draw with pencil on their canvas prior to beginning the problem that i find with that is that it makes it so that as you're painting it just feels too much like a paint by number and you feel bound and restricted to the the confines of the pencil lines and you don't feel that sense of freedom like I am here with putting in the trees. I'm kind of deciding aesthetically where they should go and I'll change it up from where I end up putting these uh, eventually in the final part of the painting when I put them in. Um, but the parts that matter, the windows and the building, if you're worried about the perspective and um, you're having a hard time with straight lines, I think, I mean, it's more than fine to use a ruler or whatever you have to do. Sometimes I lock my pinky on the edge of the canvas and just drag my brush down holding it very still and that'll give you a straight line as well but it's important that you get all of your lines that are supposed to be parallel parallel all right so now i'm taking a little bit of ultramarine blue and some little sienna little ochre just to create an idea that my darker values are going to be in this area and i i often will gravitate towards a vignette type design i like the feeling of um, just sort of this warmth of d dark trees or whatever, even in a still life, I'll do a dark surrounding with a lot of impact and um, light right in the center. So it just draws you right in. 
and um, this house was not in direct sun. The photo reference that you have here was taken at the beginning of my session painting, and so there was uh, a lot more dappled light on the building, and I liked that as I got painting on it, um, the my oil painting, plein air, it took a while and the light had changed, so when I was done painting, there wasn't any more dappled sunlight on the building, so I had to kind of fake that. So on this one as well, I add a little bit more, um, a little dappled light on the big building, but I like that they're mostly in shadow with the sprinkling of sun. And so um, one of the challenges that I have encountered with acrylic paints over the years, and I think one of the reasons why I don't prefer to use them is because I feel it's more difficult to work in layers. It doesn't blend, it dries too fast. And so my personal challenge for me in this painting was to um, overcome those obstacles, <clears throat> how to work on blending, how to work on a few layers. And I mean, basically try to make it like an oil painting. I want it to look um, as authentic. I want to soften edges, <laughs> which to me is my biggest problem with acrylics. I can't soften the edges. So I wanted to work with that. Um, so anyway, I've got my, my value pattern laid out and I didn't have to put a value over the buildings at all because they are a middle tone value. I didn't put in my highlights and that's okay. I Usually with oil paints, I kind of rub them out. Um, so I, I didn't with acrylics. Um, you can just put a little bit of white where you want your whites, your lights located. Uh, anyway, and I wanted to tell you too, even though this is, this is an acrylic video, it is totally appropriate for oil painters to watch as well. Um, obviously, <laughs> you're not using water. Uh, unless you're doing water soluble oils, but um, in this case, the principles are the same. So you'll you'll be able to get plenty from here if you're just strictly an oil painter. Uh, the colors that I have on my palette are all the same except for the burnt umber, and I put that on there on the far left corner because when I squeezed out the burnt sienna, I realized that's lighter than my Gamblin oil paint burnt sienna. So I wanted a little bit of umber on there just to darken it a little. All right, so now what I'm doing here is I'm taking the, uh, just a light mixture of green, varying shades, some a little bit more blue, some has a little bit more cad yellow and yellow ochre, just to vary the, the foliage back there. When you're painting something like a wall of trees, squint down at it and try to find um, the foundational colors before doing any other detail. You always have to work from simple to complicated. So you start with the big, broad, massed in shapes. It's impossible to look at something like that and just start putting in the trees with the trunk and the flower, the leaves and all the detail. So you have to squint down at it. And what do you see when you squint down? And when I squinted at that whole forest wall, I saw um, varying shades of cool greens and shadows. And then at this point in the um, study here, I'm putting in the lighter values in that, just massing them in, no detail yet. But at the same time, I'm cognizant of the edges of these masses because being acrylic, I can't come back through and um, uh, work the edges. So I'm softening the edges as I'm putting them down. Now you can see how I'm holding my palette here. This ends up being a problem here in just a minute. <laughs> show you what happens. It falls! <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of a, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, so easy cleanup, scraped it all back in place, and <laughs> I'm ready to go. All right, so here's my side-by-side -side photo reference. Again, this was taken at the beginning of my painting session when I was there, and um, so I'm using it just as a guideline. Um, wanted you to see that background forest and putting in some of the bright sunlight. Um, obviously still no detail, but just squinting down at that, where do I see this bright springy yellow green? And you can't stay 100% true to it um, because it would, I mean, we're not photorealists. It's not a matter of copying every single leaf. It's a matter of capturing the essence of a scene. And it doesn't matter if it's watercolor, acrylic, gouache, oil, doesn't matter. Um, the point is to just capture the light and the color, whatever drama, whatever it is about the scene that moved you, that's what you need to grab a hold of. And when you have that, you're done. When you have that one thing that you responded to, it doesn't matter if the whole canvas is covered or not, as long as you have said what it is that you need to say. So prior to beginning anything, anything that you want to do, even if you're writing a song, 
know what it is you want to say. You have to have a vision before beginning. It's like um, it, you would never grab a pile of wood and just start hammering them together and hope that a house comes out of it. Or um, sitting down and writing a story with no idea where your book is going to go. You have to have a plot. And so that's the plan with this. And I came up with my sketch and now I'm attacking this background and the foreground with that goal in mind of I simply want to capture the light in this painting. And to do that, you have to create shadow and I have to create an ambiance. And so that background forest, the cool tone of the house really set the stage for that warm sunlight. And you can see here in the foreground now as I'm working on the grass, I am selecting ultramarine blue, a little bit of yellow ochre. I want a nice cool sense of shadow down there. And so I'm keeping my brush strokes horizontal for the most part. I'm trying to cover the canvas as well. So I'm working that paint into the surface, but then I go back over it with a horizontal stroke because you can really alter the effect of your landscape by like in the foliage, you use choppy short brush strokes and mass it in that way. And then for the lawn, horizontal, horizontal grass uh, brush strokes. Always be cognizant of your brush strokes. You have, they have to have a start and a stop. Um, there are times when you're just working out the drawing that um, you don't have to have that real painterly start stop. But um, when you're starting to work on the foliage and the detail and the um, just the other pieces of information, be cognizant of your brush strokes. They are the extension of your soul. Um, brush strokes are the heart and soul of your painting. Um, whatever happens at the end of the brush usually has some sort of explanation of what's going on in your soul. And um, so I have found that when I'm um, happy, my brush strokes are light and wispy or um, or I'm, you know, cognizant, I'm paying attention, but when I'm upset or I'm distracted, the brush strokes suffer. They're the ones that show it. And um, so you, you just have to be very aware at all times what's going on um, at the end of your brush. So I'm just making a, like a cool brown for these roofs. It's um, burnt sienna, and I did use a little bit of burnt umber um, and a little bit of ultramarine blue to get that cool blue. I'll come back over that later. That was just sort of the first coat. Um, with this acrylic, it's kind of funny working the different coats. I don't normally do that with um, oil paints. I just paint directly um, with the purpose of finishing, and that's called a la prima. You do it in one sitting. So um, with this acrylic, and I did do this painting all in one sitting, but I, I sort of needed a base because it's more difficult to build up thicker layers of paint in acrylic. Um, so now for the sunlight cadmium yellow, little bit of phthalo green and some white. And you just the smallest bit of phthalo green. I mean, that's like extremely intense. When I was first learning to use it, I called it my palette gremlin. 
because it literally was just like all over my palette. So you have to be very selective and very careful with that. So as my grass and foreground comes around and closer to us, I made the green a little bit richer. I added a little bit more phthalo green, a little bit more blue into that, um, just to make it feel like as the, it, it's less in a spotlight and it's more towards us. I still wanted it sunlit, but not as um, laser beam focused green. <laughs> That's reserved for the area where I really want the focal point. See, so I'm leading the eye in from the right over there where I was working up to the little building and around behind. And a little bit of the sunlight in that big shadow passage helps direct the viewer that way. If you cover it up with your finger and just kind of look at the painting without those spots of sunlight in the shadow, what you have is just a big dead dark shadow. And so they are important to help keep it light and airy. I added a little bit of white and yellow to that background just to really make it sing back there as well. Um, one thing I do before I move on is I lighten the, the big shadows. I felt that they were just a little too heavy, especially further back. Further back, you have less contrast. So that shadow created by the house back there had to have been a little bit less contrasty because everything up close to you has more contrast. So those, even those shadows as they get further away are less, um, so I, I neutralized that a little bit. And these I thought were a little heavy, so I'm lightening them a little, putting a little bit of atmosphere into these shadows, uh, just a bit, giving them a sense of air and space in there. Now I'm coming back through here while the paint is still a little bit wet and I'm just softening some of those edges. Uh, with acrylic I have to just work immediately to soften whatever edges I want softened. Now I added that um, uh, retardant to the acrylic paints prior to beginning and that helps while painting on the palette to keep the paints fresh and wet. On the canvas, because it's such a thin layer, they tend to, um, to dry really quickly. And that's okay if you know it's gonna happen. With that retardant in the paint, it, I was still able to work with it a little bit on the canvas, but that was pretty much it, not a whole lot um, on there. Uh, this, um, this the, the paint that I put on the palette there, the next day I came back to the studio and the very next day and it was all still wet which to me is just unheard of with acrylic paint normally it would have completely dried overnight so that wet sponge underneath and putting the lid on that stay wet palette I was stunned to find that the paint was still wet even the the part on the lower part of the palette where I was mixing was still wet amazing to me so I was really happy with the stay wet palette and definitely would recommend it if you're gonna work in acrylics um, and you can see it's nice and lightweight too. I didn't mind holding it like that, it wasn't heavy. One thing I did learn about acrylic painting while working on this is I'm used to squeezing out a lot of oil paint because I paint pretty thick and I like to have it out on my palette. Um, it's a matter of efficiency, especially when plein air painting. You don't wanna have to stop and squeeze out more paint, so I put enough out. I didn't use as much <laughs> acrylic painting, so I had a lot of paint left over. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, apparently it is fine in the box. Um, I, who knows how long it'll keep wet in there, but um, that's very interesting to know. You don't need as much acrylic paint out on the palette as you squeeze out for the oil paints. I'm always telling students, put more paint out, put more paint out. Um, but here with the acrylics, it's a little bit different. So that's nice. All right, so now I'm working on the building. And one thing I want you to know, if you're painting white buildings, Pay very close attention to what 
is around the building and casting light onto the building. In this painting, um, I, I loved working on the different shades of white of the building as it moved through um, the atmosphere and the, the, just the surrounding ambient light. So um, I'll get to one part that um, on the, the big house, but on the smaller part here, I'm, you can see I'm putting a cooler gray towards the bottom um, where it was closer to the ground and it was more into shadow. Halfway up the building is a cooler, almost sky blue, uh, because it was just getting more air and sky hitting it. And I do the same thing with the large building. Most of the house, has a cooler gray shadow on it, but I take a lighter blue, like almost like a sky blue, and I just lightly, and this is something I'm learning with acrylics, is you can just scumble over and it still has that oil paint effect, and I was really happy about that. Um, so I lay a base of the building color and um, bring it down in between the windows, and I'm working quickly. I don't mind that my brush strokes are not the proper angle, but I'm just trying to get it down because I'm going to come back over it with the proper angle brush strokes. But as I work down that passage there, I make it a little bit more warmer. Okay. So as the grass is reflecting light up into the building, you can see here, I go with almost like a cream color with the slightest hint of green in there because that's the grass reflected up into the building. And I do that on the front of the building and of the little one and under the eave of that little building, you can see it. There's a bit right, right up in there. There's a bit of green um, reflected in that white paint. So just watch those areas where you have sky bounced into the white and where you have green grass or trees or another building casting another light onto the canvas um, or onto your um, white structure very important. And that's another reason why I tell people when you go out to plein air paint, be careful of what you're wearing. If you're wearing a bright red shirt or fluorescent colors, that color is going to bounce onto the canvas and affect your color decisions as you're putting your paint on the canvas. Um, so uh, believe me, I've done it. <laughs> if you're wearing something bright red, your canvas is going to have sort of a pinkish tone and you'll make choices. Um, no matter how many years you've been painting, you'll make choices based on that reddish overtone without realizing it. Okay, so now I'm coming back through here and just hitting up a little bit more of that cooler tone. This is what I mentioned, um, coming back over after that passage was dry. If you try to paint too much wet on wet with acrylics, the lower layer picks up. It's sort of like it doesn't adhere to the base of the, the canvas, and so that's a little bit annoying. So you have to be careful not to use too much water on your second coat here. So that's a that's almost a dry brush, pretty close. And then I'm just sort of scumbling over to soften that edge where the building meets the foliage, just softening that and then um, developing a suggestion of the siding on the building. Now I'm coming through with a crisp dark um, just to highlight and accent those roof lines. Now I didn't like how illustrated it looks and that's one of my complaints with acrylic paints. It kind of tends to look illustrated. And that's because, largely, because you, it's hard to soften the edges. So what I do here is I come, I don't even leave this passage, I just come back through and soften those edges. And if you forget or if they already dry on you when you're working on something, you can scumble over a passage with a light color, a lighter color, to soften something. So. I think I didn't get all of that roof line um, softened, so I do come back over later with a different shade of color and just soften it a little bit. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm coming back through and just tightening everything up, um, softening that edge of the door. One of the rules for edges 
is when to soften and when to make them sharp. Um, if you want a sharp edge on something, it needs to be either something that's flat, like a flower petal or a piece of paper, or um, it just depends on what it is you're painting. So I don't usually want sharp, crisp edges on things because it can make something feel flat. So I'm often softening. Another rule for edges is um, directing the line of sight through the canvas. So I will use a sharp edge here and there and purposely soften an edge to redirect the eye. Um, so if you're kind of leading the person, the viewer, through the painting, and if you put a sharp edge way off to the right, our eye is gonna look over there. So you have to be careful in where you put them so that you can keep the viewer on the path that you have them. Um, so that's another rule for softening edges. Remember, a soft edge conveys a feeling of roundness. Soft edges are continuity. Sharp edges are stopping. They will stop the eye. And you can use that to your advantage, and it, sometimes it works to a disadvantage, so you have to be very careful with your edges that way. Um, you can still see on the edge of that roof. It's just bugging me watching this. It, it, I, I will come back through and soften right there. <laughs> I didn't like how sharp that was in there. And um, so same with the door. I mean, can, imagine if the edges of the door and the windows are all very sharp, it will look like they're cut out of construction paper and just pasted on. And that doesn't have a reality look. And that can be part of the problem in working from photos or even from life. The longer you stare at something, the more detail you see, the more um, the values become extreme. They, and so you will end up painting them that way. So make sure that when you're painting something, you're looking around and you're moving your eye around. Work on something for a little bit, come back to it. Work on something else. It keeps your eye fresh and you can see it as a universal whole. Um, so don't, don't get all caught up on, I'm just going to paint this, I'm going to finish it, and get it all polished. Because what happens is, is you can kind of get obsessed with that area and then all of a sudden it doesn't fit in and it doesn't, it, it just looks cut out and fake. Um, so try to work on the whole thing as a unit. Um, again, here now I'm softening those edges, and you can see how softening that other edge of that roof line really helped it. Um, unfortunately, my camera angle filming this is at a slight angle, so that building roof line looks like the top and bottom roof line are not parallel. They are, but <laughs> when you're filming, you, you can't get the camera directly in front because then it would be where I'm sitting. But So there's that slight distortion. Um, so again, just softening the edges and working on some of the sunshine dapples as they come down and giving the shingles a little bit of texture here. So in this passage here, um, I did like how the value of that window, they're actually, they were shuttered windows, um, that window connects to the roof. I always like to look for passages where I can connect darks and lights, but I felt that it looked a little bit too much like, um, what is that? Is that a chimney? Um, you know, what? we don't really know what's going on. So I put a little bit of a lighter value in that lower portion of the window. It made sense to me too um, when looking at the... Um, the building when I was out there, there was sort of a light cast on the building 
and then the roof was in front so the roof was a little the little tiny roof was a little darker than the window so I put just that slight bit of separation so that you could tell that the values are still connected but there was a separation indicating that's further back and the roof is up closer to us Right, so now I'm just just kind of working on cleaning up the building edges those awnings underneath it was important that that cast shadow um, looked believable I wanted it creating that shadow underneath the awning it'll give it that sense of dimension and um, just I, I really liked that when I saw that in real life all right I'm also kind of beginning to work on the passage that is going to be the, the building that is around the wagon wheel and that shadow in that area um, because it's wagon wheels are sort of complicated I thought I um, it made sense to me to work on the background color of the building and then I just using the same brush I, I made my lines sort of rough I didn't want a perfectly drawn circle with a teeny little brush what would happen is we would go right to that we would just stare at that perfectly painted circle and it, it wouldn't have that broken old world quality look to it, that antique old fashioned spoked wooden spoked wheel. So I just kept with the same brush, kept my brush strokes light, not perfect. Um, I mean, I was careful with the spokes and I tried to make them look like, like a wagon wheel. Um, but then, and I do later come back through here and soften the edges with a little bit of flowers and all that. but. By starting with a little bit darker shadow behind it that was obviously being cast by the wagon wheel on the building and then putting the wagon wheel over it it also helped to sort of um, mute it a little bit um, you want to be careful with any details like that in your painting that it doesn't become what the painting is all about um, using a tiny brush you can really um, you can overemphasize things and then you don't see anything else so this painting it was not about the wagon wheel but about sunshine and warmth and um, using the cool and warm to help bring about the sense of sun. Certainly not about the wagon wheel. It just added that little bit of charm to the picture. Okay, now just working on the foliage around the house, um, keeping my brush strokes light and, and loose and dark. I wanted them to be in shadow. Um, so yeah, and this is just a nice ultramarine blue, uh, burnt sienna. I think I grabbed a little burnt umber to make it nice and dark. But I wanted to show you that real quick too. A little bit of water on my paper towel. Um, that's really, obviously I'm not using any medium, um, just the water to soften the paint a little if I felt it needed it. Uh, so I'm putting in my sky finally and um, I realized I hadn't had it in yet and um, gosh when you put it in there's my third value and I was really happy to have that light um, sky in there and I, it was amazing the difference between that sky and the side of the building um, so that is that just a really nice contrast for that um, so painting this obviously the green is dry so I'm dabbing in sky holes 
And then over the top of this, I will paint the trees into it. So there's that nice muted blending. Um, but for now, this is just a nice layer of getting the sky in place in and around the trees and allowing those sky holes to peek through. We love those sky holes. Be careful with them. They can quickly get spotty. <laughs> I would say it's too spotty. Um, so watch that they don't become that. I'm keeping my brush strokes loose for that, um, that purpose. Now I'm adding a few more trees in here, just dropping them in. Um, I always think of Bob Ross. What's the bravery test? Where are we gonna put that tree in, give him a buddy? And uh, those two on the left weren't there, um, but I felt that they needed to be. So uh, if you kind of cover them up and look at the picture without them, it just, it, it's okay, but there's just a lot of green and bush, just green bushes. So I, having the trees there gave it um, just a nice vertical feeling and sort of framing in the side of the house. So that was important to me. Um, now I put the trunks in and then I'm coming back over a little bit with some foliage to soften some of those brush strokes to show that there's foliage in and around the tree trunks. They're not just painted, the darks just aren't painted over the green. So foliage over the branches a little bit. And that also helps to soften some of that paint as well. So I'm just coming back through here now and cleaning it up, tightening up little sparkles and things like that. Um, I wanted to tell you too, before I close out this video, this video, um, what I'm showing you here, it's this is a preparation for plein air painting because I, I already did it as a plein air. Um, when I teach my Zoom workshop um, coming up here in October, for the landscape, we're going to be doing the same kind of thing. We're working from a photo in the studio with the idea of preparing you for plein air painting. So there's a few spots left in that. If you're interested, shoot me an email or um, just go to my website. Uh, there, If the PayPal button is still up on that workshop, that means there's still space. Okay, so now the flowers, if they're in shadow, they are cool blue. <laughs> Keep those soft and light. If they're in sunlight, I used cad yellow and alizarin crimson to get that bright on there. Um, just the final touches and um, those sun dapples on that building, cad yellow and some white, and we are all set. So I want to thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that you enjoyed this. And uh, if you have acrylics, I hope that this helped, and um, you'll go ahead and try them. And uh, if you're working in oils, this uh, hopefully is helpful to you as well. So these last few pictures that I have up on here are the finished painting, and I will leave you to it. Thank you guys so much for joining me, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps this up. I hope that this helps to clear up some confusion you might have with acrylic painting. And I really enjoyed this and I hope you did too. Be sure to like and subscribe and I love your comments and share the video too. All right, you guys, have a great day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.